Assalamu alaikum. Are you in? Can you, can you see? Hello, Tony. I don't know if you can oh, see wait me. Wait a minute. Sorry. Somebody's going to do some work, some magic here. Uh, <laughs> look forward to it. Let's have a look. You might oh, even see me in a minute. There you are. You might even see me in a minute. You might see me. Why is it not working? You're almost dead. Yeah, we've got a glimpse up here. We've got a glimpse for a second. All right. You on, Dad? No, I'm not on. Launch meeting. Open. Oh. There, there you Wait. are. Yeah. This right. is... I've still got your, ba your background screen. I need to change. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that was from his. <laughs> I'll, jump. I'll just change the screen. No I'm worries, no worries. We're not yeah. recording at the moment. You're, you're <laughs> Part of our, our Man United family, you know, so far away and. Um, you know, I just thought, you know, Dave and I have been at Man United for a long, long time. And um, I just thought it'd be good for us to do it together. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you a little story about Dave. La last week when I was receiving the award, I had no idea how to do this. I've never done it before. And Dave and Haley, you know, got me on the, online to, be, to, you know, for the, for the award ceremony. So I was very grateful. And when Ishmael, you mentioned me doing the Zoom some weeks ago, and I said, hmm, don't fancy that because I can't really do it. Um, <laughs> With Dave's support, I'm able to, to, to do the uh, the one for the Premier League. And of course, I just thought it'd be a great idea for us to be together tonight to do this. So we're really, you know, looking forward to talking to you, you know, to speaking to you about our, our different careers and our different, you know, pathways at the club and our experiences. And um, and to obviously to meet you guys. Yeah. No, it's always the, well, the, nice to meet well, you. Well, on my part, thank on my part. Thank you for inviting us. Sorry? I'm just on saying thank part, you for inviting us on. Yeah. On my part, before you start, boys, uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks to Tony for inviting me anyway, but uh, <laughs> thanks very much. And, and as Tony quite rightly said, it, it's fabulous to talk to you guys over there in Pakistan <laughs> as part of our our group, our Man United family. family. It's fantastic, yeah. yeah. So thanks very much for, for honouring us with an hour before <laughs> we uh, we knock Copenhagen out of the Europa Cup. <laughs> I'm into Looking that. forward to that. No, can we can we just say, gentlemen, uh, what a what a privilege it is for us, what an honor it is to speak to you. Thank you for taking the time out. You know, um, for all of us here, the main reason for doing this show is a lot of the fans in Pakistan are much younger. Uh, they don't really have an idea. A, a lot of them don't have an idea of the club's history of the past. So when we're able to connect with yourselves, we're connecting them to so many years of Manchester United, not just Sir Alex, but obviously before that, because you're continuing the tradition that's going on now since since Sir Matt Busby's time. And, and it's so, it's such a big honor for us as a, you know, humble um, supporters club that started, if you, if you look at Ismail, he came to me seven years ago and said, I'm gonna make us official supporters club. I told him it's crazy. So you're never gonna find 50 paid up members. We've got over 150 now in wow. Pakistan alone. In, in, in different cities, we, we, before COVID, we were doing screenings, all thanks to Ismail, you know, he's, he's a one man army. Uh, and he's he's always had this belief that he's gonna he's gonna get us through this, uh, and we're the most uh, we're the first official supporters club for Pakistan, and United is the biggest supporter club in Pakistan, like it is in the world. So for us to be able to bring you to the fans in Pakistan, it means the world to us. Thank you so much. Well, it's already worked amazing, medical getting me on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. And by the way, Dave nearly was all of some at Busby, but we won't even go. Oh, yeah, 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 no, we have had a long history, but we're willing to answer what you want and help you with whatever you want to, you know, fill you in. Yeah, absolutely. Tony, if we could start off with you, we just wanted to know about the recent restructuring of the Youth Academy. Uh, I mean, it's well known that in in recent years, from you can say 2013 to 2017 or 16, the uh, the youth uh, development into the site wasn't as efficient as it used to be or as it is now. So, uh, what steps did did United and you yourself obviously uh, take in uh, restructuring that, along with Nikki Bud? Um, well, I think I think um, I don't think we really had a a big a major dip. I think maybe went a year or two without, you know, players coming through. But I've always had a tradition that, you know, 
even in the, in the, what you might, you might call the lean years, the, the lean years, you know, you mentioned Sir Matt Busby, just after Sir Matt Busby, when he retired back in well, 1970, something like that, 70, or late, late 60s, early 70s, um, the, youth the youth development programme really um, lapsed, I would say, uh, and, until, you know, Sir Alex took over. And then, of course, you had the, the wonderful generation of the class of 92, the wonderful players, Paul Scholes, David Beckham, I think you, you all know about them. And um, I think we've had some minor blips, you know, over, you know, since, since the class of 92. But um, I think it's been wonderful uh, for Dave and I to share in this, this new wave, if you, if you like, of, of players that are coming through. You know, Brandon Williams in particular, the more, more recent one, obviously Mason. And, and of course, Marcus and Jesse and, and, um, and Scott. And there'll be others coming on. So I don't think there's been any major changes in the way that we've operated. Um, I think obviously the, foot, the youth football industry in, in the UK has changed a lot. Uh, that's changed a lot with all the different rules and regulations and, and guidelines. And of course, society has changed as well um, in, in that time. Uh, but I think the fundamentals have remained the same. And I think that's one of the, one of the, one of the things that uh, we've managed to stick to, you know, our values and our principles. And I think if we stick to them, in the longer term and, and you know, with the club that we are and the fact that we're able to attract, you know, talented young players into our programme um, because of the history and tradition of bringing young players through. I don't think, um, I think we'll be okay. I, I, you know, I don't think we, we're, we don't go up and down. We, we, we remain consistent in our values and our, and our beliefs. And of course, because we're in the foot, we're following in the footsteps of some wonderful people that, that, that came before us, our forefathers, we call them. People like some Matt Busby, of course, that, that we've mentioned. You know, Jim Murphy, Eric Harris, representing the academy from from the you know the Champions League, his Champions League days, you know, Champions League winner and all that. And we're 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 carrying on that, on that tradition. We, we're we're the proud and privileged guardians of it. That's what that's what we are, and we all have our different roles and our different levels of expertise. But we've got one purpose, and that is to keep on producing players. Manchester United's first team, if we can, and if we can't do that, getting young players' careers in the game elsewhere, and if we can do that, it's wonderful. And, and also, of course, um, trying to develop good young people, you know, good citizens of the future. And that's that's the, that's the challenge. It changes, the challenge changes each year, uh, as society changes. But you know, that is the undercurrent feeling that we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to achieve. Dave, if I can ask you, from from '98 to now. Yourself, obviously, your, your role is looking after the boys. It's 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 been a bit different now because you have so many more players from Europe in the academy. You have players coming over from South America. You know, it's it's changed from being a very local thing to being a very global thing. How's that affected what you do uh, with with regard to taking care of the boys? Well, well, first of all, just for a start, it might change again on December the thirty first when yes. Brexit comes in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, personally, I think it's wonderful that you can get uh, local boys in, British boys. I don't mean just English. I think British boys. Uh, we've had a great history of bringing some decent Scots, Scots boys in, Darren Fletcher and people like that. And we've obviously need J Jimmy, Ryan, Jimmy Ryan and the manager himself for Scots. So they tell you all the good things about the Scottish and the Northern Irish and the Southern Irish. We've had decent Southern Irish. So um, in 98... The system changed. In '98, I was youth development officer, but I had to change my job to what was called head of education and welfare because the um, Charter for Quality came in, and we had to make sure that, as, as Tony was saying, you look after boys not only on the field but off the field, and we had to make sure that we improved our education and we improved the way we looked after not just the English, the Irish and Scots, but the boys coming in from afar. You know, Gerard Piquet for a start came in, uh, Giuseppe Rossi, who's a young uh, Italian-American. Um, we had quite a few came in. Paul Pogba, of course, is well known for coming in. So the system changed educationally, first of all, where, uh, and this is something which Tony would have had to do when he was a player. They used to clean boots, work, do the washing, do the, the changing rooms, everything. But in 98, the education was ramped up. 
the support structure was ramped up and boys had to now uh, do 12 hours of education every week, which meant, you know, a day and a half off school, off training really to do it. We built this in, we built this into our program with good education, the BTEC and that for the English, English youngsters. But for the foreign boys, we brought in, um, it, we, we did two things. Number one, I would go to the country and see the boy and try and foot profile him unless he was a one that came from nowhere for lots of money. <laughs> I would profile the young man and we would assist him completing his local education in his own country. But as well as that, we, we brought out the ESOL, which was the English for Speakers of Other Languages course, which allowed boys not just to learn English to help them with their football, because they soon learned the, the football language in the dressing room, and some of it's not really present, <laughs> presentable on this program. But they, they learned other English, and it was English that ended up written, reading, spoken, and it was a certificated course that we knew would help them get points for if they did need to go back to further education if the game didn't go. So we had that, and we also had obviously the problem of um, making sure we located them in the right accommodation and that parents who are not just around the corner, a train ride away, or even Northern Ireland where it wasn't very far, but they could be four, five, six hours away, that they could be quite happy that they were in. And, and that was a job we, we really got into in those, in those years between 98 and whenever the changeover came a few years ago when Sir Alex, you know, finished. Um, and I'm going to back Tony up now as well by saying that, yes, in those days, I'm going back a little. In, in those days, you can count on my two hands the full-time staff at the the football club, never mind the academy, the football club. But by the time Sir Alex had left, it had grown three. It had grown into three figures, over a hundred. And since then, since Sir Alex retired. The um, Grammy Lee, especially. I was head of education and welfare. We now have an education manager, an education officer. We've got player care people. We've got safeguarding people. We've got family accommodation people. And I did all those jobs in those days. But now we've got everybody specifically able to do really good specific jobs. And just like Ishmael asked the first question, about the changeover that we had the few years. We've managed to keep the players coming through to the first team, but lower down, we've had to get, not, not me personally, but Nick Cox came in. They've had to get staff in place to make sure we can get the right players into the right areas of the, of the club, yeah. All right. Uh, I've got a question. For both of you, Tony and Dave, because uh, Tony is a Man City fan from his youth days, <laughs> and Dave is a uh, Bolton How did you people oh. in Pakistan find that out? I can't believe that people in Pakistan know that when I was a young boy, I supported Manchester City. That's uh, we oh. dig around. We, we, dig around. <laughs> we know a tad too... bit more, a tad right, bit more about technology. You are digging far too deeply, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in the unfortunate say, circumstance uh, that we have. Let me tell, before... do you, do you, let me tell you a story. Do you, do you want me to talk about that? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you. Well, I was a magic. I was. You're quite right. And you've done well to, to dig that out. I thought people have forgotten about that. As, as a young boy, as a young, as a young boy, as a youngster, I, was, I lived in an area where all my friends, everybody was a Manchester City fan. It was a neighbourhood thing. And, um, and I always remember becoming a Manchester City fan because uh, I think I felt sorry for them because they got relegated to the second, what they call the second division back in, in the early 60s. And I remember being at school and, and it was, they were picking teams and it was all the Man United supporters on one side and all the Manchester City supporters on the other. And United seemed to have all the, all the players. And I thought, I felt a bit sorry for them. I bet I say I'm a City fan. And that's true. That's how it started. So I became, so all through my childhood years, uh, up until signing for Man United as a, as a schoolboy player when I was 14 and then getting an apprenticeship uh, in 1968, the year they won the European Cup, 
I was a solid uh, Manchester City fan. I wore a scarf. I went to watch the games. I remember, you know, frat playing, idolising Francis Lee and Mike Summerby and uh, Colin Bell. And of course, I, 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 I was familiar with, with you know, the, the Man United trinity, you know, best Lord Charlton. But my first love, I suppose, was, was, was Man City. And I played for a junior team called Cheadle Hume United. And the, the, the City Scout used to come to watch the games. And I was dying for him to invite me to go to Man City. And, and it, it never happened. It never happened. And um, I, 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 Joe Armstrong, a wonderful man, lovely man. And he phoned the, the house uh, one, 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 one day. And my mother, I came in from school and my mum said, oh, uh, you've had a phone call from uh, Mr. Armstrong from Manchester United house. I was absolutely gobsmacked. Once you to go down to the cliff, we had to go down to the cliff for training, but I like going down to the cliff for training. Anyway, I went down uh, training to the cliff all those years ago, 1967, I think somewhere like September, October-ish. And um, subsequently trained a few times and signed a, as an associated schoolboy. And then when I left school, signed as an, what was called an apprentice professional, they have a very technical term for it now, Dave, don't they? A scholarship. Yeah. Scholarship, no. Scholarship, but he was calling it a pension professional. And of course, um, when you go, you join a club at Manchester United and they've won the European Cup in 1968 and you walk, you're driving into the cliff training ground and you're walking into Sir Matt Busby, who was like the Pope. He was God Almighty, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was in awe of him. And then you walk in past Bobby Charlton and George Best and Dennis Law, and all these, you know, wonderful players, um, I think it does have an impact on you. And I had, I had a Damascan moment, you know, I, f I fell off the horse, the shining light, and it was like, wow, what, a, what an amazing football club. And I think also the fact that even all those years ago, the players got treated very well, you know, got treated properly, um, you know, all the little details were attended to and, uh, you know, even things like your expenses getting paid and getting a Christmas hamper. And you never, you never forget those things. And now, of course, all those years later, here I am. And I still, when I bump into old friends from school and uh, from my neighbourhood, they never let me forget it. You, you're a traitor, Whelan. You, you were... No, I wasn't. No, and yes, you were. You were going down to Main Road, you know. So there, there you go. A little bit of history for you. And you've done well there, digging that out. You've done really well there, Trad. You know, I'm, I'm not sure whether I should just go off Zoom now. And <laughs> but I'm not embarrassed anymore. I used to be quite embarrassed, but I'm not anymore. But of course, I went back to play for them. I went back. I, I left United and, and went to City. Long story. But I, I ended up going back to City for about 18 months before I went on to Rochdale. So, yeah, uh, there's a little bit of history there between me and Man City, of course. But I think you know where my blood, where my affiliations yeah, lie now, don't you? I hope I've convinced you. I hope, you've, I, hope, I hope I've now convinced you what colour my blood is. <laughs> it's always red. You can renew it. Absolutely. Uh, Tony, if I could uh, ask another question about the foreign influx of uh, youth players uh, that we've seen in, uh, since 2015, 2016. I mean, even uh, under Sir Alex, we had my, uh, Magnus Akram, David Bertucci, and players like these who were uh, foreign. But uh, these days, we are paying uh, quite exorbitant, or you can say, it, uh, for, a, for a youngster, we are paying high fees to, to get them over. For example, Matthew Maya or uh, Hannibal Mejbri, and there are three or four other players as well that we paid a lot of uh, um, money for. So uh, what changed? Uh, in that aspect, that that we're spending so much on our youth system now. Well, I mean, Done. go on. Do you want, do you no, want, do you no, no. I, I, was, I think, no, I think after Ismail, you. are you, you're asking why we buy players, why we pay for no, players, no. as opposed to youth players. We are spending a lot of money on youth players now. I think Ishmael. I think I think the answer to that is that. So I've just given you a, a brief example of what what my life was like as a young player. When I was a young player all those years ago, and, and until fairly recently, until maybe until the academies were established in 1998, most of the recruitment in the UK was local recruitment. So Manchester United got most of their players from Greater Manchester, in the Manchester area. 
and they would bring mm. players in from the, the rest of the UK. So, for example, David David Beckham came from from uh, from London, um, and that was probably the exception rather than the rule. But since since you know, obviously, you know, the European Union is established and and, and it's opened up. The, the young player now in Manchester, if you're a young boy in Manchester, you're competing not only against kids in, in Greater Manchester and the UK, but Europe and indeed the world. Because that's the way it's gone. It's an industry now. We're living in a, in a it's a youth football industry. And, and for the first time, you know, in, in the hundred odd years since fo- football was established in, in this country, certainly at a professional level, you've got young boys who now have, have a value, the commodities, you know, so... You know, a young boy at 16 or 17 can be worth a lot of money to a football club. And that's a lot different to the era that certainly I, I grew up in. And certainly the era that Dave and I, when we first came to the club, came in and were working in. Um, there wasn't the, 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 um, you know, the, the financial implications of young players. They, they weren't really, you know, players who come uh, you know, to, to, to our club and they need other clubs because they, A, they love the club. And, and, and um, there, was, there was no such thing as you know, the, the, the vast commercial side now and obviously the finance side. So, so, you know, young players have agents now at a young age. So the whole face of youth football has changed and become, you know, a major industry. And that's been, that's been the difference. And of course, Dave and I and others that have been working with us over the years have had to respond to that. We don't always like it, but that's the reality and we have to deal with it. Um, but that's why... Again, I go back to the old, value, the old values and principles don't change. You've got to love football. And hopefully when young players come to Manchester United, they fall in love with the football club. They fall in love with it and they want to be a part of it and stay here and not go anywhere else. And I think that's the thing that we would hope for, for people like young Mason that's coming into the first team now. And of course, Brandon. Brandon Williams, a great, a great case in point, a more recent case in point. You know, came from North Manchester. You know, not, not um, it's quite a... An impoverished area, Dave. I think would say that. Yeah, and, well, not the greatest uh, area, no. <laughs> but 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 has has come through the system, has beaten off the foreign players, if you like, you know, and got into the first team. And it looks at the moment if he's going to establish himself and, and have a really really great career. And of course, we celebrate that because they're local boys, you know. We really, you know, and and I think the fans, I think the you know Man United fans love that because there's a history. You know, we're fo- the, you know, young Brandon's following in the footsteps of obviously the you know the the class of ninety two, and then going back the Busby Babes, so they become part of that tradition. You know, it's that baton being handed down of youth development that's been going, you know, back all all those years. I mean, four, is it four thousand odd games now that we've had a, a youth player in in the squad? But behind all of that, behind the football side, which I always th- oh, thought the easy bit, the coaching side. A lot of things, the work that Dave does and other staff at the club, the welfare side has always been very, very important as well. I think, um, I think just going back to that and the reason why we've been quite successful with our best, if you like, local boys, um, is that against, against the new rules which tighten up on you, allowing, uh, they stop you from having boys for too long before you actually sign them and get them with you. But our local boys have been with us from seven years old, eight years old. So not only myself, Tony, and the coaches get to know them, but everybody at the club gets to know them. We have, um, uh, Tony and I set up a scheme uh, 12 years ago now, Tony, was it? 12 years ago? About 2007, I think it was. When you were 75, Dave, it was. Remember that. When I was here, get lost. (laughs) We we set up a scheme where we... um, if they were right for it, and if the parents were right for it, we brought the best players into a little scheme called the Manless Program, uh, the Manchester United Schoolboy Scholars, and we actually put them in accommodation, and we brought them close to our school, Ashton Mersey, which we've been partners with since 1997, 98, and by doing that, again, it was uh, Tony and I who were lucky enough to do it, and the coaches as well, we were able to get a really good knowledge of those young players as they were, you know, coming through at 15, 16, especially. So we knew we had, we had teething problems, obviously we had development things. We had parents who quite rightly missed the, missed their young boys who were, you know, leaving home. I mean, Marcus Rashford was only a mile away from Ashton Mersey school, but we put him in accommodation. 
And to start off with, his mum, Melanie, was, well, she didn't think anybody could look after Marcus as well as she could. Uh, but he thrived. He thrived with the lady who looked after him. And also, because they were closely knit, Scott McTominay and Marcus and Jesse Lingard before them, and some of the other boys we've got, even your Sam Johnsons, who's goalkeeping now for West Brom, because they were so close together near Ashton Mersey School, they got a bonding that helped them when they actually got full-time job at the club, scholarship. And it, the bond kept them together through the next period if they could continue their football uh, um, journey as well. So I think that was helpful to us. But now the new rules, they don't allow us as easily to get boys from outside the area, not only into the club, but but more importantly, get them so that we can find out what makes them tick, what the character's like. You know, if, if, their head, if their head is not right, the feet are no good, okay? You know, you can have good feet, brilliant feet, but if your character isn't good, it's not right. And the character, Tony just mentioned, um, Brandon, what a character, what a boy, how he's coming. We're, you know, everybody's proud of him. And uh, none more so than myself and uh, Tony, who um, have been with him for many years and been part of his journey. We, we're so proud of him, yeah. Dave, on, on that same thing with, with character, I'd like to ask you something. <clears throat> the boys and myself have been very lucky to speak to a few ex-players, especially from the class of 92. We spoke to Keith Gillespie. We spoke to Ben Thornley. And all the ex-United players that we've spoken to, the theme that's always stood out with them for us is what gentlemen they are. It's the way the love for the club, the way they treat others, the respect they have, not just for the badge, but for the supporters. And, and it comes through. Clearly, this is something that's been going on for a very long time at the club, like, like Tony mentioned about the morals and the values, because you're bringing across, like you said, you're raising good people. How important is that then, to, to your point about the head having to be right? What do you, what if you have a talented player? <laughs> It's, it's just that, um, yes, we work on those things. I think Tony's tremendous at that. Because we know they'll make mistakes. And I know Tony, for one, will support those boys who make mistakes more than others in, in the club. And some, some boys, by the way, who haven't made it with us, we've probably worked harder with than, than some of the boys who've not, who have made it at the club. Yes? So we always try to get them. It's up to them at the end of the day how they come through. And all we want them to do is to learn from those mistakes. Because, um, look, it, it's, an easy one, it's an easy one for me to give as an example. Ravel Morrison was a lovely boy. Okay? Ravel was a lovely boy. Now, maybe his upbringing wasn't as easy as some people might think. And maybe there were things put into his tiny head before he ever came to us at seven, eight years old. And maybe he couldn't get rid of those things and still can't get rid of them. But if Ravel was in a room with you, you would think what a lovely guy he is. And he is a lovely guy. And probably just, uh, as you were saying there, Hassan, he could bend it in. He could, he, <laughs> could, he could nutmeg somebody going one way, then come back and nutmeg them again. He could do things that nobody. He was, he was a superb player. Same age as Paul Pogba, by the way. Played in the same youth cup winning team as Paul Pogba. But he was, he was so wonderful. It was untrue as a player. But he just could not stop making mistakes. And the mistakes, we got him through his schoolboy level. We got him through right through the schoolboy to scholar. We got him through the youth side. And by the way, there were lots of issues and, I mean, 
it was so worrying. I just was worried because the play boys he played with and trained with and were friends were all linked with people who were not the nicest people in the in the town in the city. But he got through right up to the, you know, youth reserves and things like that. But he made that many mistakes that uh, the boss had to uh, had to get rid of him. Really, had to get rid of him. He was made, given so many chances, more chances I think anybody ever's been given at Man United. But back to the others, the character is what we want. The character, Scott McTominay. Scott was a little boy. Scott McTominay just came through as a. He was probably the smallest in his group. We've got pictures of him at 12 and 13. He was the smallest. Look at him now. He, he hit somebody or somebody hit him in the last game the other day. And I think the commentator said, oh, I wouldn't like to bump into him. You know, well, he's a big, strong six foot plus man now. Yeah, but with ability. But fabulous character. Fabulous character. And he went through the development stages of the Manners programme. You know, and he, he fought his way through the uncomfortable side of living in accommodation away from your home in Lancaster, away from your mum, who she was, she was really struggling. But mum and her and Tony and myself and the, the staff helped them slowly but surely to get used to uh, this so that when, he was actually, when it was actually scholarship, he was ready to, to thrive. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask about a certain player in the youth academy nowadays, uh, Zidane Iqbal. We're interested in him because he is from Pakistani descent. Uh, his father is, is from Pakistan. So how do people rate him and how is he up and coming in the academy and what are his future prospects? Hey, do you want to start um, that one? So, sorry, I don't you're mind. On, so you're on a roll, Dave. Now I'll, I'll follow on. <laughs> I will. I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. Well, whatever, <laughs> what, whatever I, whatever I say about uh, Sidan, I'm sure that Tony will say. We'll start at what I've just been talking about. Wonderful character, wonderful boy, well brought up. Lovely, lovely father and mother. Lovely father and mother. Well brought up. Um, a good school. Good school. Did well. Technically, technically gifted young man. So pleased that he got a scholarship at the club because although the, what's it, what can I call them, the negative coaches could say things like he's not quick enough, he can't get around the field, he can't this, he can't that, he can't the other. I think you should always think of what he can do. And if there are certain things that are inhibiting him from being a bit better, for example, not getting caught in possession in the middle third of the field, instead playing the ball and moving, then that's what I think he's done over the last, well, last year anyway. I've not seen much of him now because of the COVID. But a couple of yards outside that penalty box, defenders don't know what to do because he's so technically gifted running with it. Will he make it? Well, he's made it already in my eyes anyway because he's done really well. And he'll be, he'll be a super super person for the rest of his life. Will he actually make it right to the top of the first team? Who knows? And we can't actually say that. Over to you, Tony. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would echo everything that Davis said. He's always been a very, you know, easy player to work with. Um, always. I think the thing about uh, design is his resilience because he's, he's had to compete against boys who physically have been his superiors not only within the training program at the club, but also when playing in, in, in the competitive games as well. And it's not always been easy for him. And he's, and he's been one of those boys that's been under the radar, if you like. You know, you get what you call your superstar players. Everybody thinks you're going to be the next, the next George Best or Wayne Rooney. Um, but sometimes it's players like Zidane, who I, I would call slow burners or under the radar, um, that, that, that are the ones that, that really come through in the end, you know. And I think, as David said, for him to achieve a scholarship at our football club at age 16, from where we know he came from, and, you know, he, he probably came to the club at a, a really young age. You know, people forget that, you know, young boys come in, in our club now at age nine. You know, the early, you know, the, you know, the latest now probably day, that we even take kids yeah, now yeah. six and seven. In his case, you know, you've already done eight years at the club, that's half a lifetime, before you even become a professional footballer or a scholar. 
And um, he, he was offered a scholarship last year, and that was, a, and a, as Dave said, a, a, a wonderful achievement. And I think the other thing we should mention, given that we're speaking to our, our family in Pakistan, is that we don't have a lot of Asian boys in our program, do we, Dave? Over the no, years, we've not, no. we've not had a lot, you know. No. And and um, you know, and obviously he's a, he's, he's got. He's got, two, you know, he's got two identities. He's got, you know, obviously he's got a Pakistani background. But he's also a Mancunian as well. So, yeah. um, but for him to achieve what he's achieved, you know, and to be representing his father's country in the way that he has is, is a credit to him, himself and his family. And as David said quite rightly, we, we've, we've not got a crystal ball. But with the character that he's shown and the resilience that he's shown so far and the ability that he's got, and he has, he has a wonderful love of the game as well. You know, I think we, we sometimes underestimate how much you've got to love this game. Uh, you've got to love this game enough to overcome all the hurdles that you've got to overcome. You know, injuries, um, you know, loss of form, you know, um, and all the, other, all the other distractions that you can have, you know, not playing well, not getting in the team and all that. And, and you know, but at this moment in time, you know, he's got a, an excellent an excellent chance of getting a career in the game. Whether that's going to be at Manchester United is up to him, not us with the support. But I certainly, I certainly would expect him to, to, you know, to make a mark in the game and have a career in football. And he's also, you know, an excellent young man. And he's one of those young people that, you know, Dave and I talk about, you know, and Dave, you know, works on the pastoral care side in education. I'm more on the, on the football coaching side. But we need, you know, staff at our football club need people to inspire us. You know, people talk about getting inspiration from, you know, seeing top players play or seeing, you know, a <laughs> program about Muhammad Ali or seeing a program about, um, about Lewis, the, you know, the racing driver or even, you know, um, people like Gandhi who, 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 are, who are activists. But we, you know, but we need, we need a lift and inspiration from players that, that are in the club because they're doing things that you think, wow, you know, because we know, that, we know the journeys that they've been on. You know, then we know the difficulties that the difficulties that they've had. You know, so for example, you know, not not many people in the football club would know that, you know, his mum had some problems with her health, really serious problems with her health. You know, and you know, I think at one point maybe a life threatening, but he was coming into training all the time, working just as hard. And I'm looking at him and thinking, wow, if people knew what you're going through with your family, you know, and the way that you're training, the level that you're training at. And when we have, and not, not everybody knows that because some stuff's confidential, you know. And, uh, but Dave and I knew that. And that inspired us in thinking, wow, you know, if, if, if this guy can, can, this young man at his age can be dealing with this situation the way he's dealing with it now, how much am I learning from it as a coach and as an adult? It's wonderful. So, no, I think one of the things that we've learned, we can learn as much from the players and the way they respond to situations as, as, as they can learn from us. And he's a, he's, a, he's a really good example. And that's a great, that's a great one that you brought Because he's one of those boys that, that is, is under the radar and maybe hasn't got the credit that he deserves. So we're, got, we're giving it him tonight, aren't we, Dave? Absolutely. He's a, he's a, well, as I said, he's already been successful. Yeah. And we, we, you know, Tony said about the crystal ball there, we, we can't make him into a player. All we can do is support and and get ready and catch him maybe when he falls once or twice. But yeah. on the other side, these boys uh, might give us hard times at times, might do little silly things. Might but do, might, oh, really might. Sorry, they do. They, <laughs> they do silly things. But then when they, but then when they come out the other side, um, you know, it makes us very proud. It makes us very proud. There's a young boy, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit because this boy's not been with us from seven. We've got a young boy from Northern Ireland who's, I think, I've known since he was about 11 or 12, Ethan Galbraith. Ethan has gone to Germany with the first team this weekend. He's been in the first team squad training over the last week and a half. Now, he trained near the end of the season with them. Now, I've spent all the summer, whilst it's been the lockdown and all the other things, with his mum and dad and talking to him about making sure he kept himself out of trouble in Northern Ireland because it's a nice place for going around <laughs> enjoying yourself with your friends and yeah. we've been treat we've been trying to keep him uh, in fact i think his father tried to oh you don't know this tony his father tried to buy a mountain bike off tony coulter our scout over there uh, so that so that he could go mountain bike riding 
to oh, help really? his fitness. Wow. Um, but yeah, he's, he, and people said, oh, it'll prove it when he gets back. He's, you know, people are saying, has he trained hard enough? Has he this? Well, he came back and he hit the floor running. And straight away, kick, um, Michael Carrick and Kieran and Ollie wanted him in their squad. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to make it, by the way. <laughs> but he's done okay to go to Germany this week, hasn't he, with the first team squad? Absolutely. And he's shown a lot of character. <clears throat> Yeah, but we were speaking about Zidane Iqbal, uh, and obviously I named my son Zidane as well in the hopes that he would represent United one day. He's only one. Oh. I'll send him to you after 15 years or so. <laughs> there, there's, um, there's lots of problems, aren't there? We're getting boys from a distance now, from yeah. other countries. As we said, Brexit will not help. <laughs> Brexit will not help. My, I, my, kid, I, my kid's got a British passport, Dave. He'll be all right. Yeah. But, Sorry? But I'm, I'm sure you must have. I'm, I'm my, sure my, kid's, my, my kid's got a British passport. He should be okay. Oh, that's good. That's excellent. <laughs> I'm sure you <laughs> must have. Good. Well, maybe maybe you can sort his mail out as well then. <laughs> yeah, there you, there you go. Yeah. It's, I'm sure um, there must be some very talented players in there. Uh, in, young players. In. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Atletico Madrid have an academy here now. Uh, it's just Do for they? the country. Of, uh, yeah, they've got one here in, in Lahore where we live. Uh, because it's 230 million people, but they're just obsessed with cricket. I'm so I'm so envious. You know why I'm so envious? Because they're having your curry, and I can't. Yeah. Have it. Oh, no, 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 no. That's no. what we got to bring you I'm down. For the I'm food. telling you, those Spanish people are having your curry every yeah, day, yeah. and I'm not. No, yeah. I'm not having it. Uh, no, hey, we need to get we need to get an academy, you? don't we? My United Academy in. Uh, we will uh, be waiting for you with open arms and, and all the curry you can eat. Oh dear, dear. Because I know for a fact that Manchester has the closest thing to good, authentic Pakistani food anywhere in the UK. Oh, dear, dear, dear. So when oh, you come dear. out to Lahore, you'll love it. We'll be waiting for you. We'll it's waiting. like It sounds like paradise to me. Oh, dear. It's a you've paradise. Got him, you've got it now. Yeah. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Yeah, yeah. We had, we had a young boy from... We had a young... I'm not a great curry eater, I've got to say, in the restaurants, but we had a young boring, boy... Dave. From, Right, You're eating right. that bit of boring, Dave. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when we go to a when we go to a restaurant, Tony usually picks something mild for me. <laughs> but he then asks for the hottest dish in the house. Yeah. Tony will be right at home in Pakistan. He will oh, be right at home. Can we can we actually fly there at the moment? Because I'm on the plane tomorrow morning and get on a plane. <laughs> you, you can now, yeah. They're, they're letting people in. Can from I get the a plane? Can yeah. I get a plane? Right into, is it Karachi? Where, 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 where Lord, is it? You, you can come wherever you want, Tony. We'll get there. Oh, you go, dear, dear. We'll show up. <laughs> we'll be there to pick you up wherever you land. <laughs> Tell you what, that's great. Because they, Dave's going to buy me a ticket tonight. Yeah. Online. Right. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stamp on this uh, this ceiling now because you're underneath me. <laughs> oh dear, dear. <laughs> yeah, it sounds no, like sorry, paradise to me. <laughs> I think are, are very strict on. I'm I'm not sure why. Well, I do know why. Um, for trafficking reasons, that uh, rules are strict, and I think there are some very uh, devious uh, clubs around the world and uh, one or two have been uh, punished recently. But, and we had a great... Um, we all say you're there, Dave, even though I used to support them, but there you go. Yeah, what, what <laughs> the, oh, the other side of Manchester, aren't they? Yeah, yes. yeah don't cross the main road. Oh, no, it's now the empty... <laughs> oh, sorry, well it's, done, now, it, it's now the empty pad stadium, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... it's um, <laughs> we had a great... Um, association with the club in Belgium, Antwerp. Antwerp, yes. And it really worked a treat. But we missed out. Uh, it worked a treat because the Johnny Evans of this world, the Ian and Ryan Shawcross, who unfortunately went to Stoke City, we had so many players go through Antwerp who came back and played for us. That's right. Uh, but the one thing that we tried, Tony and myself tried, was to try and get number one, some of our players across there to join in with them. But I know that Les Kershaw, before he, he, he retired, we were looking at trying to get a scouting system that brought boys into Antwerp from other countries. Uh, because they, they're, much, they're much easier, looser with the way that they allow people to come in and play for them. 
and use it, use it as a kind of a nursery club until the boy was 18 and could come through to us if he, if he made the grade. Unfortunately, this is one of the things that changed when the, when the landscape changed at Old Trafford, you know, when the boss left, that Antwerp disappeared. I, I'm sure that the club will be looking at starting up and getting another club in Europe that could take, now that Brexit's come in especially, that could allow our distance scouts, our European and worldwide scouts, to get them into, um, get them into this club and link up with the club and get our coach. We, we had coaches going across there managing the team. Warren Joyce, for a start, yeah, went Warren. from Manchester United reserves across to Antwerp and managed them. And so we, we did have a great link there, and I'm sure that will come back. And I'm sure Real Madrid, as you say, are doing a good job over there because they'll be using somebody local. They'll be paying him. They'll be getting lads together. And I'm sure that as, as, as the soccer grows, the football grows over there, I think it's always going to struggle against your, your cricketers, by the way, because your cricketers are very good. <laughs> yeah, also, um, it's just an obsession. It's like Brazil in football or England in football, you know. Pakistanis see cricket and then they kind of they forget everything else. It's, it's just like in our blood, you know. So, it's, yeah. uh, football's growing. It's, it's, it's growing. It's everywhere. It's well-loved. But, you know, give someone a cricket bat and it's a party. So, but we, we'll get there slowly. Yeah. There's, more uh, there's more of an issue. There's more of an issue also because of the fact that... Uh, Players can make careers for themselves in cricket, but football is not uh, a career-oriented no, sport in Pakistan. But doesn't, Pakistan that make right your, but doesn't that make your your um, supporters club and the group and the supporters that, that are listening tonight very even, more, even more special? Even more special? Yeah, you know? well, Tony, I mean, one of, one of the things you'll regularly see at our screenings is people driving from two and a half hours away to come watch a game that we lose at home, 1-0 to West Brom, uh, you know, I, I say that one because I met one of the younger fellas who drove over from two and a half hours away. It was one o'clock at night, and I think we had a deflected wow. goal to lose the game. And you know, I, I live 20 minutes away. I drive back home. He's got to drive back two and a half hours, get home at three in the morning, then get up in the morning, go to school. Uh, or Champions League games, which normally take place here at about one o'clock at night. You know, oh. uh, when, when we won in Moscow, yeah. I, I had a job interview the next morning and my voice was gone. So they didn't hire me. I just showed up it. and I didn't speak. And they were like, what's happened? And, you know, telling them that I'd, I'd been watching United been Chelsea on penalties and then obviously been on the drink it didn't, didn't do me any, any good. You'll so they're like, no, we're not interested. You'll have to, re you'll have to, you'll have to re relocate, won't you, Pakistan? You'll have to move, you'll have to move yourself around the globe somewhere. A little bit. Where else? A little bit. Listen, just regarding what David said about Belgium. Now, the real reason why David would like us to get an academy or some, some sort of setup in, in Antwerp is nothing to do with football, but everything to do with Belgian chocolates. Chocolates. <laughs> chocolates. Good enough. French fries. Listen, so, I, I went to, we went to, we went, I think we went a couple of times, at least to, to Belgium. And this, I think the first time we went together, we got into a nice hotel, really nice place, just off the main square in Belgium, in, uh, in Antwerp. And uh, the first thing Dave said to me, come on, we're going to the market. And of course, we go around the corner across the square and you've never seen Belgian chocolate like it. Wow. <laughs> I can only imagine. Wow. So Dave, Dave was in a good place. I, I, I don't think we saw any football, Dave. I think we just sat in the hotel room with tea and chocolate. No, no, we, we went to the football. I, I tell you what, it's the best pre it's the best pre match meal I think in any club I've ever oh, had dear, at that dear, to, yeah. to Belgium. It was wonderful. Yeah. No, no, it was it was a wonderful experience. We actually we had, we actually had scholars going across there playing, and yeah. we I actually took our our PE teacher across from school to examine a boy on the Sunday morning in the snow after he played the night before in, a, in the first team game. <laughs> Tony, if I can, I can ask you something about something that, uh, you know, surprised a lot of us. With, with Marcus Rashford, a lot of people said it was just luck. That because if Tony Martial wouldn't have been injured, Marcus might not have got the chance taken it with the goals against Midtjylland and then the goals against Arsenal. Was, was it a case of... Marcus being there at the right time, or was Marcus always destined for the top? And that opportunity was just something that, that hastened it, as opposed to, you know, being luck. 
That's that's a great that's a great question. I, I think you know chance always plays its part. I think in in in, in football and in, in life, just you know, and people taking opportunities. I think I think yeah, of course he had an opportunity that he wasn't expecting. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. yeah. But boy, did he take it. Yes. He was ready mentally. He was meant. He was ready physically, because and it, and it showed in the game, didn't it? You know, he wasn't overawed by the occasion, and he was just ready for the moment. Um, I think his moment would have come. I think that'd be fair to say, Dave. Yes. His, moment, his moment would have come. Well, I, I think, think the answer is. I think the answer, Tony, is. I'm oh, sorry, I've broken in, but the answer is in the follow-up, not just the two games and taking his exactly. chance, but he's not. He's not. Deviated. Yes, he has bad games. Yes, he doesn't play as well sometimes. Yes, he has a, a nick like he had. He had a, quite a few bad games, but there was a back injury that nobody knew about. You know, there's there's. But he has proved himself. Played for England now. He's proved himself time and time again that those two games weren't just um, pot luck, and he just took that. Little, yes, of course he came on the scene right, but he's kept it going, and of course the history is. He did go to school the next morning and finish his work <laughs> off as well. Yeah, but which, which, kept, which kept Dave happy? Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether Dave was more happy that he scored the goals that night than he went to school the next morning. No, I, Dave, get a life, Dave, Dave, please get a life. I nearly, I nearly find him the next day because he came to school in his car instead of walking it round the back. Oh, uh, so I told him off. Can, can you believe that? He scores two goals in, in a year. Yeah. Uh, you know, he goes into school the next day and he gets a rollicking from you. Come on, Dave. Yeah. You can do better than that. <laughs> yeah. While, while we're on the subject, uh, can we also talk about Federico Makeda? Because he also took his chance with you know both hands, but then he just disappeared uh, out of the scene. So it's not just luck with Marcus Rashford. It's more about hard work and how he applied himself even after the initial chances. Uh, and that's another example of why luck is not the only factor in your career when it comes to football. Trad, you've answered your own question there. It's the head that sorts out the feet. And Marcus's head and Makeda's head were completely different. Obviously, but I mean, you know, the type of heads, the, the characters were completely different. Because he was, uh, he was, he had the world as his feet was young Makeda. Yes. But, but it's easy getting, not easy getting to the top, but it's even harder staying there. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the I think the thing that we've learned over the years, Chad, in answer your question, is that when you look at the when you look at the, the whole process of, of developing young players, if you if we assume right that they're falling in love with football as you guys did all those years ago, yeah, and and fell in love with obviously with Man United, but you fell in love with the game, wanting to play, or the professional footballers, when the coaches receive them and they come into the football club. You think that, well, they're going to train every day, they're going to play their football. That's really the easy bit. That has to, if that's difficult, then that's a problem for the, for the coaching staff. The hard bit is the stuff that we're talking about. Not playing football. So if you've got players that have got talent and you're able to keep their heads on, as David said, quite rightly, and if you get that bit right, the football comes right. But what happens is, in a lot of circumstances, it's the other way around. People are dealing with the football issues, the football issues. Well, I know there shouldn't be too many issues with the football. Mm. Right? And it's, they, get it, they get it the wrong way around. So if you can sort out the pastoral care, you can sort out the issues of education and their um, having to, to learn how to behave and understand the, the culture of the football club and what's expected of them as young people growing up allowing for the fact that they're young teenagers, a lot of these kids, and they have to have normal lives. And there has to be a degree of, of us understanding that they're going to go off the rails now and again. And Dave's going to tell them off, or I'm going to tell them off, or somebody's going to yeah. tell them off. It's, the, the key thing is how they respond to that. It's what they do about that. And, and, and you know, indeed, we expect them to fall off the rails. We expect it. If we, if we expect them not to fall off the rails, then we need to go and, you know, go and see a, a psychiatrist, because that's not the real world. The real world is that these young people, you know, live, you know, very different lives to the lives that I was growing up in when I was growing up in all the different things that are going on in the world. I mean, they didn't have the internet, you know, they didn't have problems with mobile phones. There was no, there was no phones. So they're living lives that are much more different to, you know, to certainly the life that I lived growing up as a player. 
And so I think our, our job is to do our best to make sure that the pastoral care side is right and that we're, we're educating them um, to be good citizens of the future, right? And to understand that they, they, they have two identities. They are not professional footballers yet. And even if they are professional footballers, they're not going to be prof professional footballers for the rest of their lives, are they? I don't know anybody around that's, that's 40 odd playing football. It, it's, it's going to end at 30, 35. Now, whether they're successful or not, or, you know, whatever, they've still got another life afterwards. Yeah? And when do, when do they start preparing for that? Well, we would hope that we're preparing for that as soon as they walk into the football club. And that's a challenge for us, of course, because we need to... They've got this dream of being professional footballers at the top level, playing for Man United in the Champions League. Now, that is, that is like landing a man on the moon, by the way, statistically. Yeah. You've probably got more chance of landing on the moon. You know, well, Dave, you've got no chance. You're too old now. But yeah, it, you know, uh, that's what it's like. So, who needs an so, enemy when so if, it's that, if it's that difficult, <laughs> if it's that difficult, we've got to be asking ourselves, right, that's how hard it's got to be. So we've got to make sure that if it doesn't quite happen for them, if they leave our football club, they're going to leave with a wealth of, of experience, a wealth of, of, of understanding about the game and the bodies and, and how to behave in good manners so that they can get a, a career either in the game elsewhere or get a job and get a career out side of the game and I think you know, that's that's the goal for us to yeah. try to get the bounce right. right producing players for our football club but also making sure that along that journey we're preparing them for the next career the second career mm. hopefully you know uh, I, 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 um, we have got people at the club now we have a guy at the club actually with we work very hard we've got a Man United alumni now with the uh, ex-players coming in and I was actually talking to him Chris Chris McCready and um, we've got the alumni, they're being offered little webinars to go on, but more importantly, we're planning for the coming season, or he's planning with my help for the coming season, where when we try to teach boys about something that might happen in the future, or teach them about certain things that are going to go on in the future, we're going to pick out one or two of the alumni who've actually experienced actually making those mistakes, or doing that, or doing the other, and we're going to try and get them in to talk to the boys about how they went through the experiences that we're expecting our boys to go through later on, yeah. Okay, so I'll ask each of you two questions. Uh, are we going to win today, and will we win the Europa League? Well, well I always... What do you think the answer is going to be? The man. first, the first we're one. Going, we're going to win tonight, and we're going to win the we're going to win the Europa League. Then. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and we're in the Champions League already as well. Uh, can, can I ask you a question? Right, what reason would he give us for us not doing that? Squad depth mainly. Huh? Squad depth. It's a squad depth, and it's a one leg tie. And in they go, you think they're going swimming? Sorry, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting there to No, no, no. Ishmael, yeah. Ishmael, you can always have an off day, but the players we've got, that I don't know, I've not seen the team, I could guess the team, but the team that probably will go on the field tonight in yeah. personnel, but yeah. it depends as long as they have those heads, that head screwed on again for uh, their feet. If they've got their head screwed on, we'll win the game. Oh, great chance. Amen. And don't come back to me if we don't. <laughs> when, when, would, when, would you, when, when would you ever bet against Man United winning never, football? Never, never, never. 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 Yeah, well, there you go then. There, so there's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've overstayed our welcome now, haven't we? No, 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 no. never. No, we, listen, we, 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 we'd keep you on for days if we could. You probably wouldn't be too happy about it. We yeah, well, listen, listen you'd, have no, you'd have no money in the bank, I tell you, we're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> you're worth, you're worth yeah, you, you, you would have no money. Listen, I'm telling you, you would have no. You'd have to go and sell your houses. I'm telling you, and, and, and do, uh, I tell you what, for a few curries, I tell you what, for a yeah. few curries, you know. Eh? So I, I'm yeah. lucky, Tony. My father, my father-in-law's got a restaurant right just across oh, from my place. Oh, so, I thought you were going to so say it was I, in Manchester. I, 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 <laughs> I'll bring you. I'll bring you to Manchester. Sure, no worries. I thought for a minute. I thought you were going to say, "Is it Manchester?" Oh dear, no. Nah, if it no. was, if it was, I'd be outside your place with with, wow. with with like buckets of them right now. Oh dear. Well, it's been it's been an honour and a privilege to have have spoken to you guys, and obviously to to you know to the wider family 
or Man United supporters club in in Pakistan. Um, you know, we, we are absolutely over the moon, Dave and I, and thrilled to, to be able to do this and just share some of our experiences and, and, and have a laugh along the way, I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's the privilege is all ours. Um, you know, for us, hopefully when, when COVID is gone and we can invite you out here, not, not of course for the carries, but also because of what you represent, you know, to you know, for, for the club and, and for all the work that you've done. And it would just mean the world to the fans in Pakistan to be able to speak to you. And we spoke to Ben, we spoke to um, Keith and they said as well, hopefully, because, you know, it's uh, like you said, it's a family uh, and, and, and it's just the most amazing feeling in the world. Wherever you are, you run into a fellow red and just like, my wife is sometimes like, why are you meeting him like he's one of your best friends? I was like, he's a United fan. Of course he's one of my best friends. Yeah. We've got so much to talk about. Where do you want to start? 98, 99, 2008, the Busby Babes. We can go on for days. Absolutely. Listen, it's, uh, it's been fantastic. It's, uh, uh, I've I really enjoyed my hour. It's passed very quickly. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, Tony and I do send our love to everybody over there. Thank and you. yes, Ishmael, we hope we can win tonight. <laughs> we hope we can beat, uh, well, I hope Sevilla beat uh, Wolverhampton, actually, because I'd rather play Sevilla. But, uh, and then we'll play we into Milan in the, the, in the yeah. final. And please, please stay healthy and well, please. Yes. And you as well. Difficult please, days, absolutely. difficult times, but let's hope that we can yeah. survive, all survive it all and do this again and maybe even get to Pakistan for a curry. I'm into that. Yeah, I'm into that. Okay. All and Dave, 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 Dave we'll, we'll get you, we'll get you, we'll get you one with ice on it. Listen, you can have an ice curry, Dave. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Etsas, Etsas saying a lad from Norway came across. That's his right. mother, yes, his mother made a wonderful curry for me. So there you go. I don't want, I don't want any of your tea made with milk and cream. Uh, it has skin on top, but the curry she made was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we, we'll call her up, find out which one, and we'll have the same I one. Made for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we're, all Pakistani, we're Pakistani, we're all related to each other. I'm sure I'll find a cousin who knows us. Yeah. He's, he's playing in Molda now. Yeah. He's doing very in well. Norway. Scor yeah. Scoring goals, he's, he's doing very, very well. Yeah. He's doing really well, yes. I met him. We went to Molda last, this last season, and we met him, and... Um, Oh, another player of, of Magnus. Yes. Magnus. Yeah, Magnus. Yeah. Yeah. Magnus, Magnus. We met Magnus as well. We Magnus had a great time Magnus. up there in Magnus. Bowl, yeah. Magnus. Wonderful place. Anyway, listen. Are we tuning up? Yeah. Enjoy the match. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder you, wonderful. Again, wonderful to have met you all, guys. Thank you. The yeah. pleasure God, is all God bless you all. God bless you all. Bless you. All the best, Thank everybody. You. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye -bye. Take care. Happy Curries. No, shut up. We'll be waiting for you, Tony. We'll be waiting for Happy you. Happy Corys. <laughs> <laughs> to you. Bye. 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 Bye